Hi, I'm David Bush, and this is Bush History, and this is segment number five in our set of videos called The Presidents, and today we are talking about James Monroe. James Monroe was the fifth president of the United States. His vice president was Rufus King and then John Quincy Adams. His political party was Democratic and Republican, as was Madison, as was Jefferson before him. His term of office, 1817 to 1825. Who came before him, who came after him? As I said, James Madison came before him. He was a Democratic Republican. And Quincy Adams, also a Democratic Republican, will follow him. Any unusual circumstances surrounding his ascent to the presidency? Well, not unusual. As a matter of fact, now it had become typical. Monroe would be Madison's Secretary of State, was also from Virginia, continuing with the tradition of the Secretary of State being the next in line for the presidency, and also continuing with the now established tradition of a Virginian becoming president. So we have, he is the final member of the Virginia dynasty. Federalist opposition to the War of 1812 and new economics embraced by James Monroe, beginning of the American system by Henry Clay, weaken the Federalist chances. Any catchphrases associated with James Monroe. We have the era of good feelings. He took differing opinions from the Federalists and from Democratic Republicans and merged them into his cabinet. It wasn't all rows, there were disagreements, but he was able to merge the two political parties. When he left office, was it by choice, defeat, etc.? He did not run for re-election in 1824. He was succeeded by his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, which, by the way, it's a good idea to simply call him Quincy Adams and differentiate him from his father, John Adams, in that respect, because people can forget otherwise. Domestic issues and events. In 1819, we have a panic of 1819, which had occurred because of credit being used for land speculation as the United States headed west, and the banking system not, be able, not being able to support the credit and people not being able to pay back the money. So there was a loss of funding in the second bank of the United States, and it was really going to hurt Andrew Jackson's family, which is something to consider when he becomes president. In 1820, we have the Missouri Compromise. Missouri wanted to enter the Union as a slave state, but it was right smack dab in the middle of the country. Should it be a slave state or should it be a free state? Remembering that balance, remember that balance in Congress is very important because you have, if you have too many states, slave or free, they will control Congress and the other side will have very little they can actually say. Well, as it happens, Maine wanted to enter at about the same time. So Henry Clay comes up with a very obvious bargain. Says, all right, I tell you what, Missouri slave, Maine free, we're all good. And okay, it went that way. That's called Missouri Compromise. In 1824, we have the corrupt bargain. It's the election of 1824. And in that corrupt bargain, without going into a thousand details, because it's kind of a long issue, we end up with the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, and Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson, in a dogfight in the House of Representatives. There was no clear winner in terms of the majority of electoral votes. And the election of 1824 was the first presidency, the first election, was a popular vote had been recorded. Now remember, this affects the next presidency, but it's happening while James Monroe is president. And after a lengthy debate in Congress, Congress turns around and awards the presidency to Quincy Adams. Quincy Adams did not have a majority of the electoral votes, he did not have a majority of the popular votes, and Andrew Jackson is out of his mind. And then it gets better. Quincy Adams turns around and makes Henry Clay Secretary of State. And Henry Clay had asked his supporters to support Quincy Adams. So Andrew Jackson's out of his mind, hence they call it the corrupt bargain. We have a whole bunch of internal improvements while James Monroe is president. He endorses the building of canals, he endorses some of the early building of national roads, and that's part of what's called the American system by Henry Clay. The American system had three parts. You had a banking system, you had a system of taxing, and you had internal improvements. And, well, let's see, how is that going to work? The taxing would come from international trade. It was a tax on imported goods. And that money would go into the banking system, and that money would then come out of the banking system to finance these internal improvements. Hence, the American system. A little different from Thomas Jefferson's point of view, two presidents earlier. Foreign policy events. In 1817 and 1818, we get the Rush-Bagot Treaty. I always want to say bagel, but that's wrong, obviously. 
And that's the line between the United States and Canada, extending from the east coast of the United States, if you imagine a map, to the center of the Great Lakes, basically establishing a boundary between the two nations. In 1817, 1818, we have the Seminole Wars, and the Seminole Indians were largely located in Florida, and Andrew Jackson is going to chase the Seminoles into Florida and get involved in all these bloodbaths of wars. And of course, the public liked that stuff. Um, 1819, the Adams Owners Treaty is going to get us Florida from Spain. They probably would have lost it anyway because they really couldn't protect it, but we get it for $10 million from Spain. And in 1823, we get the Monroe Doctrine. Now, the Monroe Doctrine was not written by James Monroe, and it is not one document. It's actually in an address by James Monroe to Congress in which he says in different parts of the speech that Europe should not interfere in the Americas, that Europe should consider the Americas settled and out of their sphere of influence, and the United States will not interfere in European affairs, and basically tells the Europeans to stay out of America. But what you're not going to find is an actual document that says the Monroe Doctrine. It simply doesn't exist. And I used to send my students on a wild goose chase to find it. Of course, they couldn't find it. So anyway, that's where we are for James Monroe. Next up will be Quincy Adams. I'm David Bush, and this is Bush History, and uh, we'll see you soon. Have a good day. Bye.